The Lord be with you. And also with you. So good to see you all. Order of service is divine service setting for opening hymn. Now the silence, it's just one verse. Let's stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. <coughs> if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are free. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We observe silence for self-examination. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany is from Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the, of the Lord, and your royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be called desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm of Psalm number 128, read responsibly out of your bulletin. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and you shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your rabble. The Lord bless you from Zion, and you will see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to, to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is a person, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the name of but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the attendance, the utterance of wisdom, and another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by the one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. <laughs> Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. 
Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding tw 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good <coughs> wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit to the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <laughs>
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is the Gospel lesson. If you had been with us during our recent trip to Spain, this is one of the refrains you would have heard. Thank you, Good Shepherd. That is your extraordinary and surprising gift at Christmas enabled us to see and do things we would uh, otherwise not have done. Eating lunch at a very nice restaurant in Rhonda. Thank you, Good Shepherd, Gail said, right at the table following the prayer. Paying the fees to enter a myriad of museums and cathedrals and two ancient synagogues. Thank you, Good Shepherd. And one we will never forget, having another nice meal on a sunny balcony in a small mountain village in the south. It's a village called Pompanera. The square houses, bright and white, clinging to one another and clinging to the side of the steep mountain. Picture red geraniums hanging in baskets against those snow-white walls. Thank you, Good Shepherd. We had lunch outside in the sun. I was, I was bit by a cat. <laughs> a different story for a different sermon. <laughs> and then we walked around in this pristine mountain village, small shop, a sort of general foods store. There were three enormous wooden barrels, each with a different wine that came from the grapes that grew on the terraces, narrow terraces that had been carved out of the side of the mountain centuries before. The wine was being sold for about three euros for a two liter minimum. While getting their daily baguettes and eggs and such, villagers would also come in with their two liter ceramic jugs and fill them up. The owner, an elderly woman, encouraged me to try some and gave me a cup. I opened and closed the spigot as fast as I could, in part because it came out like water out of a fire hose and in part because it seemed only right when just taste testing, but I knew I was going to buy some. <laughs> but the owner was miffed that I should take so little, and through Stephanie, our interpreter, told me to have more. So I did. <laughs> it was sweet and young and tasted of the barrel, and I bought a jug. Thank you, good shepherd. Wine over there takes on a different role than it does here. They don't serve a lot of milk or beer. It's water or wine at, at every meal after breakfast. And the wine is cheap and it's good and it's ubiquitous. It's served to children. It's served at lunch, even in the nursing homes. It's the main thing served at every family occasion, every formal occasion. And of course, it's the main thing served at weddings. And so it was 2,000 years ago on the other side of the Mediterranean. In first century Palestine, there was no honeymoon, but the wedding celebration itself could go on for days. People must have dropped in for a while, left to attend business, get some sleep, and then returned for more eating and drinking, storytelling, singing, for more celebration. At this particular wedding, disaster strikes. They've run out of wine. Now, this is not a Wisconsin crowd. There's no beer or brandy in sight. <laughs> the groom's family is embarrassed. The mother of the bride is in tears. The guests are disappointed. Mary notices all this and says to her son, you know, it would be nice if you did something about this. He, in turn, is short with her, distances himself from her, it seems. He calls her woman, not mother or mom, and says, in effect, this is none of my business, nor yours, for that matter. And besides, my time for doing such things has not yet come. But Mary, she knows her son. She knows he'll come around knows that sometimes he cannot help himself. Sometimes he cannot help but fix that which is broken. Maybe that comes in part from his background as a carpenter. He's always 
picking up the pieces and putting them back together. He's a, he's a fixer. And so Mary says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Jesus considers options. There are six huge stone water containers in the door at the house. They are there for ritual washing of hands. Fill them with water, he says to the servants, and they do, to the brim. About 30 gallons each. Now, take some to the steward, he says. You can imagine their lack of enthusiasm. They know it's water. They just filled them. But they're servants, and so they do as they're told, and they take out a ladle full of water and hand it to the steward. He takes a sip and is shocked. It's, it's wine. And as the wine swirls around his, his tongue, and as he breathes in and swallows, he tastes not any old wine, but a very fine wine. A lot better than cheap stuff they've been serving up to that point. And there's a lot of it now, about 150 or 160 gallons worth. This wedding celebration will eventually come to an end, but it will not be for lack of good wine. It was his first miracle, <clears throat> and still today some Christians question the wisdom of this being his first miracle, or any miracle at all. <clears throat> it wasn't really wine, they say. It was unfermented grape juice. But the Greek says wine, oinos. And moreover, moreover, just think about the dynamics here. Think about your dads and your uncles and your brothers and, and <coughs> sisters and cousins. Can you picture them sitting around for days, telling stories and singing songs and playing sheep's head and all the while, sipping Welch's grape juice? <laughs> of course it was wine. Others are scandalized not by the fact that it was wine, but by the miracle of this story. It's an assault to their reason and senses. But I love what Wendell Berry has to say, and I know I've quoted this before, but it's worth repeating. Whoever really has considered the lilies of the field or the birds of the air and pondered the improbability of their existence will hardly balk at the turning of water into wine, which was, after all, a very small miracle. We forget the greater miracle and still continuing miracle by which water with soil and sunlight is turned into grapes. And I love what C.S. Lewis has to say. Every year, as part of the natural order, God makes wine. God does so by creating a plant which can turn water and soil and sunlight into a juice which will, under proper conditions, become wine. God is constantly turning water into wine. The miracle at Cana consists in a shortcut. That's all. Not a big deal. God's ordinary way of making wine is through a lengthy, controlled, predictable process. God's extraordinary way of making wine happened just once that we know of at a wedding in Cana. But not everyone likes this first miracle of Jesus. And if you think about it, their, their argument is with grace. He's giving way too much, 150, 160 gallons worth of a fine wine to people who have done nothing at all to deserve it, to people who have probably already had enough. Their argument is with grace. The Lord's generosity, way too much, whether at Cana, or at this baptismal font, or at this altar, or at the gates of heaven. The Lord's generosity and grace always have this scent of scandal nearby. Too much of a good thing to people who do not deserve it. In fact, if you're not shocked, appalled even by the generosity and unconditional nature of his grace, how absolutely free it is 
how there's nothing whatsoever you can do to earn it. And how there's nothing whatsoever someone else has done to disqualify himself from it. If you're not shocked by that kind of grace, appalled even, then it's probably not grace that we're talking about. It's, it's something else, some other thing, some other man-made religion based on works, not on grace, a, a quid pro quo religion, this for that, on more of a more or less a, an equal exchange. You give him your works, and God gives you his salvation. You make a decision for Christ, and he rewards you with heaven. But that's not grace. That's just another religion of works. Grace is a different kind of, of exchange, and the, the scale is way out of balance. It works like this. We give him our sin, and he gives us his righteousness. We give him our crud, the filth of our thoughts and words and deeds, and he gives us his innocence and his purity, the blood of the Lamb without blemish or fault. We give him our well-earned death as the wages of sin, and we are rewarded with what? With eternal life, free unearned. In matters of the Christian faith, that's the only kind of exchange worth talking about. So, not everyone likes this first miracle of Jesus because he's giving way too much of a good thing to people who don't deserve it. Soren Kierkegaard said somewhere that while Jesus turned water into wine, his people seem determined to turn it back into water again. And notice how Jesus brings this grace into a very human occasion. While wedding customs differ from culture to culture, one thing they all have in common is a, a family reunion and a celebration and a whole lot of human drama. There are relatives who haven't seen one another in a long time and some of them prefer it that way. There are two extended families, that of the broom and that of the bride, who are getting to know one another for the first time, really. Some happily, and others not so much. In every family, there, there's that eccentric aunt, and that difficult uncle. I'm going to be one of those one day. The old ones resting and gossiping in the caterer's flimsy folding chairs, maybe complaining about the young ones running around driving everyone crazy. Wedding is a, a messy business, a, a very human occasion, fraught with lots of intense emotions and the high probability of problems. In fact, one of the things pastors like to do when we get together is regale one another with wedding stories, like when the teenage son of the groom threw up just before the vows. As a pastor, what would you do with that? Stop everything and wait for someone to find a towel? Or pretend that it didn't happen? Darn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. <laughs> Weddings are a messy business, full of human drama with people looking at one another, the, 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 the groomsmen and the bridesmaids, lustfully, suspiciously, angrily. And at Cana, Jesus brought his wonderful grace right into the middle of that human drama. The dearth of wine at a wedding is a small problem in the grand scheme of things, isn't it? They would have been okay. No one ever died for lack of wedding, uh, wine at a wedding. But the Lord understands human drama, and not even this is too petty for his concern and compassion. He has this old habit of fixing things, picking up the pieces that are broken putting them back together. And so he blesses this wedding with some 150 gallons of fine wine. That's grace. That's generosity. 
And that, by the way, is the only way you or, and I, or anyone else for that matter, gets into the kingdom of heaven, by his grace and his generosity. In verse 11, John calls it a sign, which begs the question, a sign of what? It's a sign of what he's come to bring to your life and mine. He's not come just to fix broken weddings, but to fix broken marriages, broken bodies, broken relationships with one another, with, with him. He's come to fix lives that are broken and in pieces. And he does it today. And he will do it on the last day with the same generosity and grace that he exhibited at his first miracle 2,000 years ago at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. In our prayers, we pray for Ken Beck, who suffered a major stroke and is dying at UW Hospital, husband of Cheryl. We pray for Floyd Beck, uh, Gecki, who is also very seriously ill, also at UW Hospital. We pray for Jackie Kuby, who is ill, for Artis Blazik, recovering from open heart surgery. We pray for those who grieve, for the family of Frank Plotz and uh, the family of Oscar Hackbarth. We pray for Marie Hilgendorf, who is recovering from surgery. Let us pray. Please stand. <coughs> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For glad and joyful hearts, receiving the blessings of God with thanksgiving and using them wisely for the glory of the Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For pregnant women, for the protection and care of the life in their womb and for the blessing of God upon husband, children, and home, for the aged, the infirm, the widowed and orphaned, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those troubled in spirit and those whose hearts despair of the troubles and trials of this mortal life, for the sick, the suffering, the grieving, the dying, for Floyd and Ken, Jackie and Artis, for Marie, for the family of Frank, the family of Oscar, for those whom we name in our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, the community of faith whom God has established by the blood of Christ, that all our leaders and those who serve us in Christ's name may be blessed in their service and their work prospered as God wills it. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation and those who make, administer, and judge our laws, for the causes of peace and justice here and throughout the world, for those in the armed forces who protect and defend us against our enemies, for the laws that are good and just, and for judges who are wise and faithful, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the tithes and offerings we bring as part of our worship and symbols of our faith and trust. For our sharing this day in the body and blood of Christ. For lives of faith and repentance, renewed by the divine spirit that we might live to God's glory. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the grace of life and the courage to live the new and holy calling into which we have been baptized for the faith to trust in the good and gracious will of our Heavenly Father, who has promised to hear and answer his people's prayers, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remembering the faithful who have gone before us 
and renewing our commitment to leave, those, leave to those who follow as a legacy of truth and faithfulness, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
order of the service continues with the preface on page 208. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts and lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, <coughs> giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. As the glory of your presence once filled your ancient temple, so in the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, you manifested the fullness of your glory in human flesh. We give you thanks that in his most holy supper you reveal your glory to us. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood so that we may one day behold your glory face to face. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Steve Zilmer on behalf of Bowling for the Band. Thank you, Pastor. It is the season. Bowling. No football next Sunday. We're watching a lot of it today. We, uh, this is our 11th year bowling for the band. We have an individual that's here this morning, Mrs. Patricia Newberger. Raise your little hand over there. There you go. Uh, she does that IQ. There you go. That's enough. <laughs> anyway, we've been very blessed to have her in our congregation. She donates her time to direct our band. The school, the day school band has approximately 25 students in it this year, and they are doing great. Before Christmas, they had a band concert. I came and listened. You know how much I know about music. It sounded really good to me. <laughs> but anyway, Glenn, I heard you laughing over. Today, I'm going to read something from Scripture that supports our band. I haven't done this before, but this is, I'm taking select verses from Psalms 149 and 150. They should praise him with dancing. We could substitute bowling maybe in there. They should sing praises to him with tambourines and harps. To my knowledge, we have a tambourine. I don't think Mrs. Newberger is looking for a harp. And we go on to a 150, chapter 150. Again, praise him with tambourines and dancing. Praise him with string instruments and flutes. Mrs. Newberger doesn't have one quite like this. I don't know if she wants one, but my point is we do not have a Mickey Mouse band here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Pretty sad. But we have a march that's called Mickey Mouse March. Oh, okay. All right. Mickey Mouse March. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with crashing cymbals. We definitely have cymbals, without a doubt. I have seen them and heard them. Uh, just a couple of things. Last year we raised approximately $10,000. We do not make money, we, I mean the school, on the bowling. 50 cents or bucks, whatever it is, it's not much. We make money on the silent auction items that people donate. We have about 70 right now. I'm sure that Sharon and Gail would be happy if there was more. The other thing we make money on is the sponsorships. If you're a business, or not a business, it doesn't matter. If you're going to be here or going to be gone, please consider being a sponsor of one, two, or all three categories. That's where we make our money. So I'd ask you to do that. A couple other things. In the last several years, the last few years actually, part of the donations go towards scholarships for the music students. And we've given out about $8,700 plus or minus in the last few years. Last year alone in 2012, we gave out $2,400. So where does the remaining money go? Well, in the past few years, last year it was bowling for the band and bus. We needed repairs to bus. Before that, it was bowling for the band and technology. Before that, it was bowling for the band. We're back to bowling for the band. We need our desperate need to repair some of the instruments that we have. And also, Mrs. Newberg, as I understand, would like to get a trumpet and uh, some chime, they would be used. I don't know how you can tell a used chime, I'm not sure about that, but I'm sure she knows. So anyway, we need that. We get money from Kohl's, $500 the last few years, because employees of Kohl's donate their time to help with bowling for the band, even if they're not members of this church. Isn't that great? We get $6,400, or we will this year, or excuse me, if we raise at least $6,400, we will get $1,600 from Thriving. That's the ratio. We raise less than that, we get less than that. 
But otherwise, we get 1,600, and we've been able to get that every year, to my knowledge, since we've started the bowling for the band. So I ask you to please consider bowling because you come. As of last night, we only had about 30 bowlers. We need 100 plus to have the alleys to ourselves. A lot of you have been there. If you don't want to come and bowl, come and have a little gameetly kite with us and bid on some of the silent auction items. Um, the bowling is $15. The registration sheets are in the back in the narthic. And for that, you get free pizza and the kids get free soda. And the sponsorship sheets are in the back in the narthic on the table. How much longer have we go past? That's probably a long time. <laughs> I guess I gotta go, so I gotta take my band on the road. But thank you very much. We'll see you next Sunday. The registration times and everything's back there. So thank you.